Hello, Dr. Mom. Hi. So we have started recording. How are you, Victoria? <laughs> Hello. Okay. I can hear you. Yes. So we're good there. Um, hopefully everyone else okay. can hear. You guys can go ahead and give a thumbs up. And Dr. Hartline should be signing on soon so she can do an introduction. We are recording early, um, which is just fine. It did an automatic recording. So I will, if you are ready, mm -hmm. I will go ahead and make you host. Wonderful. Okay. Are you seeing my PowerPoint screen? I am. It's not okay. in slideshow mode, but I know you know that. <laughs> okay. Let's try. I appreciate that gentle reminder. <laughs> okay. Now is it in slideshow? The view you have? Yes, it just hasn't started. So that from the beginning. Okay. Portion. So you see my very first screen. I do. I see the um, side slides numbered to the left hand side and then your main beginning slide to the right. So. Oh, wait a minute. That's not what I want. You're ready. Wait, wait, wait. No, okay. that's not what I want you to see. Uh, wait one second. Uh, okay, that's not what I want it to show. So hang on just a second. Um, let's see, one minute. Um, um, we Hi. You can click on the top left button that says from beginning. Okay, yes, but now do you see just my very first page or do you see my notes on the side? No, you shared the wrong page. I shared the wrong page. Okay, um, let's do a new share and there. Okay, now are you seeing just the first page? Yes. Okay, so you don't, you don't see my notes. Ah, oh, we did it, yay! Okay, all right, we're gonna silence the phone. We don't want that clicking in. And I think I want to make sure that I've, I won't worry about that. 
Okay. Now I'm gonna go back. Everybody should please uh, mute their microphones when they connect. That is everybody except Dr. Lavelle. Okay, I'm here, can you hear me? Yep. Yes, I can hear you, and I okay. have everybody else can hear you. Okay. We're, we're waiting for the appointed hour. Okay. Are you able, okay, now we have you on the screen, so you're not able to see my screen any longer. I, I'm going to introduce you, and that is correct. Okay. I see your screen, but after I introduce you, you, you should do? start. I do not see your screen. After I introduce you, you should start sharing okay. your screen. Okay. So it's least, four o'clock. Yep. Well, not according to my computer's time. It's three fifty. Okay. Okay. Um, and and uh, so I'm assuming that when you start sharing your screen, then you will also take off your still picture, and you'll be a live picture when you're when you're talking to us. Yeah, you know, another word using your camera. Yes. Yeah, and I just see me. Perfect. Yep. And while you're getting that together, I'm going to let John know that he needs to shut down his computer because I've got some acoustics now that are going on. Right. Also, he shouldn't be using any bandwidth, but he can come and watch. Right. Right. John? Okay, he, he's leaving. <laughs> he had asked if I wanted him to be in this room or in his office and I said, no, I want it to be real. I want you to be in your office, but that's not gonna work with the acoustics. 
All right. Yeah. Okay. So okay. it is now. It is four o'clock now. Um, and it looks like we have 19 or 20 people connected. So I'm uh, Beverly Hartline. I'm the Vice Chancellor for Research and Dean of the Graduate School at Montana Tech. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our all Zoom public lecture uh, uh, session, um, which is featuring Dr. Elise Lavelle. Dr. Lavelle is uh, one of our, she's the Highlands College Distinguished Researcher for 2020, uh, a well-deserved honor. Uh, because, and she is a psychology uh, professor at um, Highlands College, I think also affiliated with the Department of Interdisciplinary Arts and Sciences. Is that correct? Um, and she's been yes. at Montana Tech for, I think, seven years or so. Um, maybe six or seven years. And during that time, the, the number and, um, and sophistication of students doing research projects in many fields, not just in, in psychology and sociology and gerontology, but also uh, uh, involving students in other programs mentored by other faculty has really grown. It's my pleasure to, and I asked you to join me you can unmute your mics and, and clap your hands for this and join me in welcoming Dr. Oh, Dr. Lavelle for a presentation on undergraduate researchers' perceptions about conducting and publishing research in peer-reviewed journals. However, before we do our clapping, I need to let you know that this session is being recorded on Zoom. And um, by being here, you're providing permission for that. And uh, welcome all of you and welcome Dr. Lavelle. Thank you. Thank you. So I would like to begin by, first of all, thanking all of you for choosing to attend the presentation. And I would also like to begin by sharing my screen. Um, and I'm my my wing woman is Victoria that's helping me with the technology. I've also got a daughter or two daughters out there in Zoom land that might chime in. Um, but as I go to share the screen right now, I'm getting a message, Victoria, that says host disabled attendee screen sharing. So Victoria, if you could help me with that. Okay, I didn't get that message, but I did go back to your participant area and make you host. Okay, great. So if you can stay with me for just a moment. All right, Absolutely. select window or screen. Now, I think this is the one that we want. And if you can let me know if you're seeing the first page of my PowerPoint presentation. Yeah, I am, and it is in slideshow mode. Perfect. We're moving the right direction. Okay. Now, I'm going to minimize right here. No, don't want to do that. Hang on. Okay. Are you still hearing me? I am hearing you and it's showing your Zoom meeting now, but you should be able to get back to your PowerPoint. Okay. Looks All good. Right. Okay, showing the PowerPoint. And then on this screen, I just need that. Okay, we're good. You can see our, the, the main screen. Looks great. Okay, here we go. So thank you to each of you for being here for this presentation about undergraduate research and looking at the data that I've collected um, since approximately 2014 in working with undergraduate researchers. And as I begin on this presentation, I would like to start with a quote that is meaningful to me as it associates with undergraduate students conducting research. 
And you'll see in the green print, Chance Favors the Prepared Mind by Louis Pasteur. The reason I love this quote is so often we hear today, you know, oh, the person was lucky. Um, oh, it was by chance that um, something was accomplished. And I've come to believe that chance certainly happens, but it takes an awful lot of work and a lot of effort. And if our minds are prepared and engaged, we improve our chances to accomplish whatever it is that we're wanting to accomplish. And so this particular quote was put together by Louis Pasteur. He was uh, a scientist and also an inventor. And what he discovered was pasteurization. Um, and he invented this through looking at germ theory. And so when I think of my undergraduate students and we begin to talk about research, I tell them to consider what is important to them in their lives um, and to look at research topics based on what is important to them. And if they learn the basic techniques of research, which we will talk about, then that seems to help them and benefit them. I know that it benefits them in having research concepts, not only to conduct research, but as they move forward into their careers and other positive indicators learning about research. So before we move into all the wonderful things that my students are doing and accomplishing, I would like to thank a couple of people um, that are at Montana Tech Administration. First of all, Dr. Hartline, Bev Hartline, our Vice Chancellor of Research that introduced me. She has been here along the way, um, sometimes gently encouraging that I try new directions, and sometimes a downright shove that is good on occasion. And bottom line, she's been there with me through all of this, and I'm most appreciative of not only what she's done for me professionally and conducting research and learning more, but especially my students. Whether it's been a student earning a certificate, a two-year degree, a four-year degree, or aspirations to go on into graduate studies, Bev Hartline has provided solid support for students and their research. And for that, I am immensely thankful to Dr. Hartline. Also, Dr. Carrie Vath has been supportive in the promotion of my students presenting research on campus at different functions at the school and listening herself to my students' research. And then there's Chancellor Cook, who came to my intro to psych classes and provided a lecture about his research on mindfulness. And then he took it one step further in that presentation he gave to all my intro to psych students he invited them all to dinner at his house. And so my intro to psych students enjoyed dinner at the chancellor's house that he and his wife, Stephanie, prepared and served the meal for my students. And I'd like to say that there, you know, there's a possibility there could be a study there that the association of eating dinner at the chancellor's house and then students that choose to conduct research because some of the students I'm gonna share we're in that group that ate research or ate research, <laughs> ate dinner at the chancellor's house with he and his wife, Stephanie. So um, let's go ahead though and, and get back on topic. Um, last person that I would like to thank uh, specifically is Dr. Scott Risser in that um, he very meticulously goes through our institutional review board forms, which are the forms that let us work with human subjects. So whether students are conducting research in psychology, sociology, gerontology, they have human subjects. And the IRB approval that I turn into him is not only the typical pile of paperwork that is for the participants in the study, but then because I like to study my student researchers as well, there's a second pile of paperwork and forms. So the IRB forms, they, they get to be quite detailed and quite lengthy. And so thank you to Dr. Risser for his efforts there. 
And then, of course, too many to mention by name, the many faculty advisors that have supported research and colleagues that I have been able to conduct research with. And lastly, also in career services, Sarah Raymond, who works with our students that conduct research and how to promote the research they've conducted to the employers and the employment that they go out there and seek with their degrees. And now I've saved last but not least, my family that I want to thank that is present at this presentation via Zoom World. Um, my husband, John Garrick, that I have to tell you the very first time I met this man, I thought, oh my goodness, am I gonna be able to keep up with this guy intellectually or not? And I felt like I had to even set up a little bit straighter as I was talking with him. And I'd like to say after more years than we're gonna count, um, I'm not sure who challenges who more, but I know that we are a challenge for each other and I'm forever thankful for that. Additionally, I would like to thank my two daughters, Courtney and Lindsay. Uh, I am a first generation college student and research suggests that if you earn a college degree, then your children will too. And I can tell you that both my daughters have earned college degrees. Lindsay is an architect living in New York. She was working in Manhattan with COVID. She's now working from her home in Long Island. And my youngest daughter, Courtney, followed in my footsteps a bit, earned a bachelor's degree in psychology, and she was working wonderfully with um, at-risk teens and in a nonprofit. But now my daughter has gone to the other side. She works in for-profit and financial planning, and she really likes making a lot of money. But I think eventually she'll switch back to the other side. But at any rate, thank you to all of you that are present here today. Now, let's move forward and talk about my outstanding students. So we are going to guide this question, this proposal, this presentation. Whew, cortisol is spiking. Um, we are going to guide this presentation with four questions. The first three questions are true false. For my students watching this for extra credit, these are the three questions that you need that are true false. And then you need the fourth question as well. That's the one you're getting the abstract for. So if you could, in reading these questions, just go ahead and jot down the answers. I'll give you just a moment to read them and then you'll see these questions through the presentation. And keep in mind that as you get to that last question, the idea of chance favors the prepared mind. Keeping in mind that as you are learning, educators know that what we're teaching you today is so rapidly changing that if we can teach you how to shape your reasoning and your thoughts, research is an outstanding platform to do that, it will help you to have a more prepared mind. And while I could say I want you to memorize and regurgitate to me different psychology concepts and theories, yes, that's important to be familiar with, but possibly even more important is that you know how to use your mind uh, to quantify, to qualify, and research will do that for you, the techniques and research. So let's go on to our next slide, and we are going to begin to answer question one. Question one is, do undergraduate students describe being thrilled about conducting research when the topic first comes up? And I can tell you that is 100% false. Um, undergraduate students are not enthusiastic about the idea of conducting research. Initially, when they begin, I see people turn bright red. I see them go white maybe even a hint of green. They are very nervous and uncomfortable with just the word research. And in our introduction to psychology classes, chapter two is all about research. And so the comments that I get are, oh, I don't need that. 
And one of my, a, a comment that just makes my heart kind of ache is I'm just a two year student. I'm just a freshman. And they're implying that they don't have the ability to conduct research. And now mind you, again, I have certificate students, two year students, four year students that are conducting research. But what we know from, from the research is that community college students, particularly in STEM, benefit in a number of very positive ways um, with the type that you see there. And so it's outstanding benefits to students in the conducting of research and in earning their degrees. And we're going to talk more about the positive accolades of participating in research. So let's move on to question number two. Now, I've mentioned I have the different types of students, the certificate, the associate, and the four-year degree. We're going to talk about this particular group of students that came to me and the common denominator of the students in the photo you see, three are students and three are gerontology participants that were a focus group for us. And yes, I have IRB approval to share all of these photos. Um, so please don't worry about that, Dr. Hartline. So question two, each one of these students wanted to earn a research scholarship. They were in each enrolled in Introduction to Psychology. They each had dinner at the Chancellor's house and they listened to his mindfulness research in Introduction to Psychology. This is pretty much where their common ground ends as to working on a research project together, okay? So, what we had to do was meet together collectively, learn about each other, and see what kind of research project could we do that engaged everyone in the group. So let's go through the students now and talk about their different places in their academics. So the first student that we have is a non-traditional age student. He was earning his degree and still is, he's to graduate this May in civil engineering technology. It's a two-year program at, at Highlands College and Eric Martin is the instructor for this particular uh, program. In addition to the two-year program, he also is working on a surveying certificate. And so Nate was very interested in the chancellor's mindfulness presentation. And he, in fact, had used some mindfulness in, in his life previously before attending school. Um, so that was Nate's common ground. Now, you'll notice in the picture right here, he is with a senior participant in the study that was conducted. And you'll notice there is an art project involved. Now let's go to our second student participant, and this is Bailey. Bailey is quite a driving force in this particular project. When we think about publishing this project, which we are presently working on this semester, she is the most highly motivated of our entire group in getting this publishing accomplished. But now let me tell you about Bailey. She knew coming into Intro to Psych that she wanted to earn a bachelor's degree, preferably in chemistry. And Bailey would have to explain to you the very narrow specifics of exactly the type of chemistry degree that she plans to earn. Right now, she is uh, metallurgical and materials engineering is the title of her present degree with the minor in math. So this young lady had volunteered working with seniors in nursing homes Definitely she had the math interest, so we had to find a quantitative piece to this particular study. And she appreciated art. Art projects were part of what she'd done working with elders, uh, volunteering in nursing homes when she was in high school. So then we go on to our third participant. This participant is working on a two-year degree, an associate degree. 
um, at Highlands with Michelle Morley as her advisor. And this student, Miss Ashley, knew she was interested in art. She was a guiding force of the art that each of the elder participants contributed to. And she is contemplating either graphic design or art therapy, but is completing the Associate of Science at Highlands before she moves on um, to the bachelor's in art. But when you look at the interests of all of these students put together, what we came up with was a mixed methods study, meaning that there was a quantitative analysis, a pre and post assessment, meaning these students ask each of the participants questions that related to geriatric depression and anxiety. But now mind you, these students also wanted to understand mindfulness and how, what were the mindfulness scales of these geriatric participants. We could not find a mindfulness scale that was specific to geriatrics. So the very first photo that you saw with the whole group together this group created a survey with the focus group to then ask their participants. So again, they had the pre-assessment, looking at anxiety questions, looking at depression questions, looking at the uh, mindfulness questions. That was the pre-assessment. Then the participants engaged in this art activity with the students and then there was a post-assessment. So we looked at, did their anxiety, did their depression, did their mindfulness, did the levels change? And so the students were able to show with their statistical analysis, the changes in the elders in those areas. They also did one-on-one -on -one interviews, conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews and learned about the elders as individuals and what was meaningful to them in their life. Hence, it was a mixed method study. They interviewed elders and did the pre and post assessment with the quantitative analysis. And that one, as I said, we're working on writing up to go ahead and get it published. Now, let's go ahead and move on. And we are now looking at the different ways that students can approach their research journeys. So we have some outstanding uh, research scholarships for undergraduates. The um, URP Undergraduate Research Projects is a one-year scholarship that students write the scholarship. And then when we have what's called a SURF that the faculty mentor writes the, for the scholarship and the students participate. The one that we just referenced was a SURF because this was a first time college experience for all three of these students to conduct research. Now, also students have the opportunity to present to faculty, to administration, in classes. They present at Texpo, which is an annual poster session presentation. They also present in our community, things like um, Zero to Five, which is a nonprofit, the Kiwanis, the Rotary, different local organizations and then national presentations as well. And as I mentioned, Dr. Hartline has been immensely supportive of our, our students traveling out of state um, as well as in state to more regional types of poster presentations. Now, let's narrow things down looking at the actual research projects themselves and how students can get involved. You see the um, classroom individual research projects and of these classroom individual research projects, these all start in the intro to psych and intro to social that we're talking about research. They express interest and then maybe we go to a scholarship or we go to um, a kind of um, individual project that doesn't have a scholarship. But intro to psych and intro to social what kind of give glimpses and ideas, kind of projects that are related to research. Then um, students can go ahead and, and decide scholarship, independent study research, or they can take a class called research methods. 
for research methods and that one, the students are doing a bit more in that they complete that IRB form, they do their own study, conduct their own study and get the IRB approval from Dr. Risser for their study. Then one other avenue that students have to conduct research is with classroom group research projects. And we do those in Psychology of Aging, Aging in Society, and Abnormal Psychology. Now, let me give you a little bit of a glimpse of some of these topics. Mind you, there tend to be, when there's a few people, we have to find a common denominator that brings all the students together, and then we have to figure out a way to include everyone's individual interests as well. So the first topic I wanna to talk about, the first study, is one that was actually an individual project. The student was male, non-traditional age, and he was really fascinated with empathy as we were learning about empathy. He also liked TED Talks. He hadn't been exposed to TED Talks prior to college. And so with that interest, he wanted to know if I give a pre-assessment about students' empathy levels and I show them a TED Talk that is full of empathy, then will their empathy levels change over that short time? And that's one that was done that, that then was also published. Another study, uh, again, showing you these interests, was a non-traditional student that was a nursing student and she's a mother of four children. And actually she's now a nurse. She graduated from the nursing program, but at that time she was a pre-nursing student. And she was interested about cell phone use and how cell phones might be associated with socialization or how cell phones might be associated to addictions. And so as she looked at students in the classroom, she wondered about her own children and also wondered how do these students get their work done with all the time they spend on their phones. Now, the other young student was a single male, non-traditional age. He lived with his pet pigeon and two German shepherds. And this student didn't even own a cell phone, didn't want to own a cell phone. And he was amazed. How do these students get their work done with everything going on with the cell phones. So that was the direction of that project. And again, that one was published. And also on that project, uh, one of my colleagues at Highlands College, a math instructor, uh, Jeff Draper, was also a part of that project. Let's take another glimpse. I mentioned the gerontology group projects. You've seen the one that was the scholarship that the students did the pre-post assessment and they did the art project. But then I had a classroom full of gerontology students. They were really interested in technology use and they wanted to learn what seniors living in independent living and assisted living, what they thought of technology. And so in this project, they interviewed participants but then they also taught the elders the areas that the elders requested that they wanted to learn more about. So my students went and, and taught them. That was an added benefit of that particular project. Um, and so, and those took place at two different retirement communities in the Butte area. And then I had another group with the gerontology. They were very, very interested in film. They really wanted to know about entertainment and elders' perceptions of entertainment. This particular group, the elders, they each had one participant. So you had one student researcher, one elder participant. They met with the elder participant, learned about what they identified as entertainment over the years that was most enjoyable to them. And once they partnered with them and had that interview, the elders shared their favorite movie of all time. Well, then it was the student's responsibility to get that movie, and they went and watched the movie with the elder. Then the students, after watching the movie with the elder, had to come up with a current trendy movie of right now that was similar to what the elder participant had selected. This was a very interesting project in that the big finding that came out of it was the elder participants more than anything, they wanted to talk 
with the student researchers. Even when they had their favorite film that they'd requested and the students handpicked a film for them, they wanted to talk. And in some instances, the movies were completely shut off. But that was a rather fun project. And the last one that I want to mention before we move on from here is Abnormal Psychology, which is another group class project. Mind you, in Abnormal Psychology, I have students that are working on behavioral health certificates um, that are coordinated by Ryan Mulcahy that is at Highlands College. And then I've also got students that are possibly earning a bachelor's in biology, one in particular that comes to mind, earning a bachelor's in biology, but he was ready, getting ready to go on to medical school. So I have people at certificate level, associates, and then all the way on up to graduate type of studies is, is their perception. But in this abnormal uh, project, they were very concerned about stigmas of mental health, and particularly in Montana, stigmas of mental health. And so they interviewed family members, loved ones, um, and gathered quite a bit of rich data to understand stigmas about mental health. And that one was also published. Okay, so let's go on to our next slide. And we are shifting gears here. Now we're going to question three, which was, you know, are there more females that are conducting research in STEM disciplines than males? Absolutely not. Unequivocally, 100% no, there are more males conducting and employed in STEM disciplines. And so on this slide, I have a number of sources that I'm sharing with you that begin in 2011 from the US Department of Commerce and basically saying that they realize even though women are half of the workforce, they're an untapped opportunity as far as employment in STEM. That was back in 2011, but in 2020, the University Association, American Association of University Women, looked at the number of the workforce and that only 28% of individuals in STEM are women. Again, suggesting that we need more efforts to encourage women, uh, whether it be research, but within the STEM fields. And yes, psychology is a science and it is within those STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math. And then a bit more recently, June of this year, in looking at data, Stanford University was looking at data of females and publishing academic publications. So these publications were not specific to STEM, but academic publications. And there was a 23% reduction in the U.S. Um, especially among the younger early career women, which I'm not sure if that, you know, possibly that's associated with childbearing and other responsibilities as well. I don't know that for a fact, but I do know there's a reduction again um, with COVID and women and publishing their research. So now with those, that data about women and STEM, I want to narrow a bit further and look at college students that are parents. So a college student enrolled that is also a parent. And I wanna look specifically at females too. This is an area I've conducted research. And then also my student Raven Scott, that was my work study student for two years. Um, she is now working on a bachelor's degree uh, with the two plus two social work program with the University of Montana, but she's working on the, the degree from Butte. She was very interested in learning about um, how parents balance the roles of being a parent and being a student. And for her specifically, she's also a single parent so there was quite a bit that she was juggling and balancing. So not only has she conducted and pu published a couple of studies, both quantitative and qualitative analysis, she um, also worked for two years, as I said, my work study student, but also working with our student parent program 
which we learned. We initially in year one titled it Student Parent Support Program. We couldn't figure out why people were not coming at all. And so we surveyed, we did a little more research. They didn't like the word support. It was like we were a support group instead of a fun, engaging activities for students that are parents and their children. Um, but at any rate, um, Raven has put a lot of dedication in, into research. So now I'm going to narrow this just a bit further. And this is going to be the last piece that I'm going to share with you today. And so this last piece is a study that I'm presently working on with Dr. Marilyn Lockhart, who was the chair of my dissertation committee. And let me tell you just one second about Dr. Lockhart. I read her research, which helped me to determine what um, doctoral program I wanted to study in. And after finding her research, I knew that I wanted to go to Montana State University. I knew that I wanted to have her as the chair of my dissertation committee. Now, what this woman did about, oh, a year into my studies, she invited me to go with her to a conference that she was being appointed as the president of the Adult and Higher Education Alliance, which is an organization. It was quite an honor to go there with her. And over the years, she has continued um, to support and to um, actually we, we're friends. We've, we've become friends over the years and also wonderful colleagues to, to share and, and bounce ideas. Um, so this study that we began she was interviewing graduate students and I was interviewing the two-year college students. And then we were looking at the differences between the groups. But what we found was this group, this very narrow group that we discovered in our sample of females that were community college students that were looking at a STEM direction that had participated in research that were parents and they were living in poverty. And also, I don't have in the title there, they were first generation college students. What we discovered were some very intriguing themes about these women. And they described fear about conducting research and presenting it and publishing it, fulfillment, and also how their family was intertwined in the process. And you can see the five themes right there that they came up with. And now I'm gonna share these themes in their words. And we're gonna go through these relatively quickly because we're, we're reaching the end of our time together, but let's go through these. And as you look at the first one, I'm merging together themes one, two, and three. So we are looking at increased academic confidence feelings of inclusion act academically where before they felt a bit isolated and improved self-worth. What these women basically are describing is if you're familiar with the imposter phenomena, um, they, had, I, they had everything that was outstanding as far as academics, but they didn't know how outstanding they were because of previous perceptions that they had of themselves. So participant A, and I'm just gonna read these off to you because I know some of my students, you're using your phone and you may not be able to see these too terribly well, but participant A says, it research made me aware of what I was capable of and being a non-traditional student of high school dropout, always was told I was never gonna go far, never going to really do anything, reminded me how intelligent I really am and how much I'm capable of doing. Participant B says, I never would have imagined myself being into research, would have thought, oh, that's so hard. That's like scientist kind of stuff. I felt a little more relieved and more confident about my abilities. So I found out through research that I was smart and that I had a lot more going for me if I only put in the effort. Then we go on to family being interwoven with learning, which was another participant A states, 
interviewing different people. There's just so many different ways of looking at something. I think it's given me more patience to more open mind. People's different experiences will cause them to look at something different than the way I look at it. And then she talked about making the revisions for the publishing. She brought her family into that process. And, and when she was giving presentations too, she brought her family because she believed I definitely bounced stuff off of my husband just to try and get an opinion of somebody that wasn't really familiar with the subject that I was researching. So she wanted to make sure that it was understandable and user-friendly to all that we're learning about research. Participant B, I never thought that I'd go to college. When I had my son, I realized that I needed a direction in my life. My child to have a good future, having a newborn child, just coming out of an abusive situation and wanting to feel purpose in my life. So the research helped me kind of a different direction in college and what I really wanted to pursue. So you can hear this empowerment and, and how they bring in their families. And the last theme that I want you to look at is how they describe that it enhanced their career pursuits. And so participant A actually says, I think well, research will always be a part of my career. And she is working on being a licensed counselor. Participant B, they, meaning college employer at the university that she's currently attended. She's, she's no longer at tech, but they want me to work on more research. I find myself still continuing onward. She enthusiastically shared a new career goal. I was getting an associate's degree and now I'm working for a master's degree in speech pathology. So again, she's suggesting that the research helped to broaden her path. Now we are going to go to our very last slide. And for my students out there, the question you're supposed to get the abstract for, this is question number four. And I pose this question to all of you out there in Zoom land. Where is your research gold? Well, the way you find your research gold is you ask yourself, what's important to me in my life? Who's important to me in my life? And if there's something or someone that's important to you in your life, research will help you to have a greater depth of understanding and appreciation. So back to chance favors the prepared mind. We're going to enhance that just a little bit. Chance comes your way more often with the prepared mind through research. So please consider where your research gold is. And I hope you find the fulfillment that many of my students have described and the outstanding pleasure that I have had to work with all of these wonderful students. Thank you. And I'd like to open this now if you would like to ask some questions. And I'm not I got a question for you. Wonderful. I was curious I was when it came to that project where the students were working with the students were working with the feedback. Uh, okay. People working with the uh, participants and picking their favorite movies. How challenging did some of those students find it to to get a movie that was similar to some of their to the to the, to the participants' favorite in a modern day setting? Because a lot of those movies seem like they're very very different than today. That's a, an outstanding question. And yes, it was quite challenging. Um, the most difficult to overcome was in today's movies, we have a lot more explicit sex. Um, we have a lot more explicit language. And that was offensive to some of our participants. And one participant that was the most challenging to find a movie for, as we talked in class and, and she was just almost somewhat childlike in her views. And 
we ended up selecting, um, or I say we, it was my student. There wasn't a we about it. She came up with this Beauty and the Beast. And the woman absolutely adored Beauty and the Beast. We did not learn this in the interviews, but Disney movies are her most favorite presently. So, yes, it was challenging to find those movies and then also challenging when the participants didn't even want to watch the rest of the movie. They just wanted to talk <laughs> after all the effort to find the movie. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Okay. So Elise, you've got a question in the chat. It says, was question two true or false? Question two is looking at the traditional, let's go back. Question two is looking at the traditional uh, or non-traditional student and what types of students are interested in research. And the answer to that question is, I found that all students are interested in research after they get over the initial fear of that word research. So a majority of traditional students like to conduct research, non-traditional, not so much. That is 100% false because across the board, I believe all of us like to conduct research if, if we just find the topic that's of meaning to us. Yeah, it is. It is so exciting to be the first person to discover something, and that you know that's one one of the things I'm sure your students have yes. figured out. As uh, it's kind of um, almost addictive, that that part of it. Um, but I was going to ask you've taken you've taken several of your students to conferences away from campus, um, which is unusual uh -huh. for the two year students particularly. I, I, could you uh -huh. tell like what what you think? they get out of the experience of being away from campus and presenting their research in a, in a bigger forum in a different state they might never have been to and possibly some of them haven't been on a plane before and and so I mean, this is you know talking about and presenting your research and, and also getting it published in journals is is a huge uh, new experience for for many undergraduates yes and so the first part of that question as far as the impact for students. When we have in-state conferences, sometimes there's an overnight stay. Uh, sometimes we it's just a, a one-day travel. What the in-state conferences do is usually they're poster sessions and the students get to see other students work in other disciplines. So they learn about different ways to approach research, not just in their specific discipline. They have developed friendships. They have developed collaborations as in sharing of a couple of schools. Um, so it gives them lots of opportunity. It exposes them at a much greater level. Now, when we take it to a regional conference or a national conference, for example, the National Conference of Undergraduate Research, I believe, given the setting of the National Conference of Undergraduate Research, you have thousands of students and posters. It's a week-long celebration of research. And I took one student to the University of Central Oklahoma, which is where I earned my master's degree and finished up my bachelor's. And she had not traveled uh, to Oklahoma before. It was the first time that she had left her two daughters it was quite an undertaking for this young woman to go and to travel. And her learning was extensive. She met people from all over the globe at that conference that should not have an opportunity to experience. And I am confident, you know, that student, as outstanding of a student as she is, 
she was struggling with the balance of her children and and her partner and school and I really thought I was gonna lose her which sometimes with my two-year students they stop out I didn't lose her and I am convinced it was that conference and that experience, the empowerment that that gave her being on that platform. Um, I, it's it's just monumental. And Bev, it all happened because of you, because you kept finding the monies to support my students. Well, you and your students are welcome for that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions? So I think you should give extra, extra credit for any of your students who are on this Zoom who ask a question now. Mm. <laughs> okay, you heard it from Bev. So that's 10 extra points if you ask a question. 10 extra points. Think about what you've been working on in your classes. You could pull a question from the different research you've been turning into me the poster that you created. Or from your talk. Yes, or from the talk. What first got you into studying um, aging? Hmm. That's a great question. My grandmother was a very strong influence for me. I would spend summers with her. I grew up overseas uh, with my parents, and I would spend the summers with her. And I adored my grandmother. Um, my mom was an artist, and she had a facelift, and she was very much into preserving youth. And so I guess that contradiction of how outstanding my grandmother was and then my mother that was very preserving of, of youth, um, I wanted to make a difference for elders and to work in that capacity. And I, when I think of humans on this planet, I'm, I'm often drawn to elders and their, their wisdom and then also their understanding of how to tell it like it is and not mince words. Maybe it's not the way you want to hear something, but they tend to not mince words. You know exactly where you stand with them. Thank you for that question. So it looks like you have um, a question or a comment here on chat okay. from Audie for it says, is the student parent support program still available? This is the first I have heard of it. I was wondering if there is anything like this still going on with all the COVID stuff going on. Right. Good point. So the person that is now coordinating that program is Michelle Morley. And so Dr. Michelle Morley, she's located on the Highlands campus and she would be the person to ask on that. I'm, I'm not presently involved in the program, but I know Dr. Morley is uh, coordinating that. So Michelle Morley, Highlands College, that's your contact person. Any more questions? When your students begin conducting research or prior to that, do you assist them in developing a way to pursue a specific topic of qualitative or quantitative research? Or do they yes. come up with that on their own? Okay, yes, I do help them um, and in intro to psych and intro to soch, when we have in-person classes, we play a research game and they turn in their research in what we call chunks, four chunks 
Um, that first they form a proposal about the research, which I review and make sure that it's viable for what's coming up, that they've got all the specifics they need, but they choose that focus and direction. At that very beginning of chunk one, some of the students are completely perplexed. They have no idea what they wanna do. Then we schedule an appointment and we go ahead and talk through what their interests are. Maybe they like hunting and what's the psychology of that? Maybe they like the sportsmanship of using a bow and arrow. Um, maybe they're interested in learning more about addictions. So we find out what it is that they wanna know about together. And then they turn in the remaining pieces. That's what we do in person. For this semester, my classes are via Zoom and online and I meet one-on-one -on -one with my students via Zoom if they're having difficulty coming up with a research poster and an idea. So it depends on the student as much time as I spend with them one-on-one, -on -one, but I do not ever turn down, and that word never, I don't like the word never, but to my knowledge, I've not ever turned down any student that wanted to talk about their research project to help them to brainstorm. But I don't tell them what to do. I, I spend sometimes a, a considerable amount of time brainstorming, but they figure it out. Does that answer all of your question? Yes, thank you. You bet. What is the response you're looking for to question number four? The answer for question number four? Just is like that... the response you'd be looking for. I don't really understand the question. Okay. So that is one of the questions that if we have a Zoom call, I could help spend more time to go through it with you. But I'm wanting specifically what's of interest to you. What are your career interests? What are your goals? What might you want to learn about personal relationships? You figure out what's important to you, and then you go find that abstract that's on an existing study relating to the topic. So it's all about you in this question. And then looking through our library system and finding a peer-reviewed journal article that is about that topic that you're interested in. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. You bet. So we have probably time for one more question. Okay. If there is one more question. Elise, one it's more. Marilyn Lockhart. Hi, I Marilyn. I just wanted to say, woo! I just wanted to say what a wonderful person Elise is to work with. Uh, and it's she's just done such wonderful work. Uh, it's just pretty astounding, uh, the good things that she's done. It was wonderful to hear about it. Thank you, Elise, for inviting me. Thank you, Marilyn. And that was Marilyn Lockhart, my my mentor and the chair of my dissertation committee, and most importantly, my friend. So Thank that's you, wonderful. Marilyn. That, that, that is wonderful. You do have one question. Okay. From Max Anderson and the chat box. Even though okay. students don't even though students don't like to conduct research for these studies, is it usually fulfilling once the research is completed? It becomes fulfilling before it's completed. Where it becomes fulfilling is when they collect their data. Whether it's a survey and they're looking at what the real answer is to whatever their question is, what they might think the answer is, and then what the data shows, or if they're conducting interviews, that is where it becomes immensely rewarding because you're beginning to get solid data, empirical evidence that's giving you answers to your questions, not just making assumptions. So yeah, it gets really exciting 
even before it's completed, even before it's published. It gets exciting when you start collecting that data for most people. Yeah. So thank you all. Let's give Elise a round of applause. I don't know if Victoria can unmute everybody or or, or they can unmute for themselves. But thank you so much, Elise, and everybody have a great evening. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.